The Word of God comes to us tonight in the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Good evening. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Paul. Um, uh, well, before we get into God's word, I do want to express uh, my words of uh, appreciation. Um, really thankful to be invited to preach here this weekend. Um, the joy I got to experience worshiping, um, the prayers of revival, um, being deeply moving and ministering, the brush of fresh air, I, I, I feel like I, I got to breathe here. Um, my elders at my church uh, put a cap on my speaking engagements for the year, um, so they limited, and they did this in order to protect me from overcommitment uh, and from burnout. And yet, they still allow me to go out because they understand, uh, as they've witnessed happen time and time again, when I go and I preach, um, worshiping with other brothers and sisters, fellowshipping with other Christians, uh, how recharged I am when I come back, how renewed I am, uh, restored I am, how I am revived. Uh, and I am confident that when they see me tomorrow, uh, even though we will have all lost an hour of sleep, <laughs> that they'll know that I've come back revived and recharged, renewed and restored. Um, so I'm thankful for that. I just want to also say I'm really encouraged by the dedication of all those who came out, uh, gave up their weekend, traveled here in the midst of the rain to come and to worship, to sing and to pray and to hear God's word. I'm really thankful for all the servants. I know I'm not hosting the uh, revival, but just really encouraged to see how many parts there are, how many people are involved, all the hands and the feet that could uh, allow something like this to happen so we would happen smoothly. Uh, and then I'm also really encouraged by the pastoral staff here, um, their love, their care, their ministry to you all. And I just hope that you would understand that, know that, appreciate that, and in return, you would encourage them and thank them and pray for them and care for them, uh, just as you were already doing, but that you would do so more and more. Um, so with that being said, would you join me in prayer? And we'll get into God's word. Good and gracious Father, we thank you for this weekend. Uh, we thank you for the work you started to do even before this weekend, and we thank you for the work you will continue to do when this weekend is over. But we also thank you for this very present moment. And we pray and ask that as you speak to us now through your word, by your spirit, uh, the words would not find themselves like the seed that fell on the side of the road, or among the thorns, but they will have fallen on receptive hearts because your spirit did a work in preparing us to receive what you might say and speak and convict us with. So be with us this evening, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. When you look at the history of revivals, when you look at revivals in the Bible, revivals that have taken place all over the world, including Korea, if you were here for the morning seminar. One thing you'll notice in common, one thing you'll see a common denominator, a reoccurring theme, is that all of these revivals are accompanied with conviction of sin and then confession of that sin among the people gathered. My point, my purpose this evening is that repentance is central to revival. Now, it's not a formula. It's not if you get a lot of repentance, you'll get a great revival. It's not like you can manufacture revival through 
repentance, but there is no question that revival and repentance go hand in hand. God uses repentance to bring revival, and God brings revival as he stirs repentance. You see, it's when as people we see our sin, and we see our sin not as a cute little puppy, but as something disgusting and appalling in God's holy sight, when we know that it's an offensive stench to God, when we see sin for what it is, that any honest conclusion about that sin leads us to realize we can't do anything about it. We're powerless, hopeless, and helpless. I truly believe that anybody who sees sin and senses how wrong and wicked it really is understands that they are powerless to handle it. And so when your sin comes before you and you see it, it'll lead you to do one of two things. The first thing it'll lead you to do is to try and ignore it. When your sin is before you, you know you can't do anything about it, what will you do? Oftentimes we close our eyes, we pretend like it's not there, we pretend like we don't see it. We hope that if we can convince ourselves it's not there, then it won't bother us, it won't sit in our conscience. When I was in college, my freshman year, I was randomly assigned a roommate, and he was a nightmare. A nightmare straight out of boarding school up in Massachusetts. He was the fraternity type. Every night for him was Friday night. And one evening, he stumbled into the room. He was drunk again. And usually, I just would ignore him. But this time, he decided to vomit all over our floor. Now, luckily, we had towel flooring. But I remember being so angry at him that I refused to clean it up. Why should I clean up his mess? And he was too drunk to do anything about it, so he passed out. I remember looking at it, and it was so disgusting. I mean, I could see what he had for dinner. And being so angry that I refused to clean it up, so I did what any logical 18-year-old would do. I went out to the dorm hallway, and I got our school newspaper. I brought it back in, and I just covered it. And the next day came, and I expected him to clean it up, and he didn't. But I was stubborn, so I refused. And so the next day went by, I expected him to cover it up, and he did it. But I was stubborn, and I refused. And day after day, it went until the very last day of the semester. <laughs> you see, after a while, what was so disgusting was in sight, but kind of out of sight, because we had a newspaper covering it. And by the time we had to move out of the dorm, it had hardened so much, we had to take a flathead screwdriver and a hammer to chisel the dried vomit off the floor. And why do I mention this? Because I think this is how so many of us handle sin. One way we do it is we ignore it. We pretend it's not there. We try to cover it up. We cover it up with our good works. We cover it up with our good deeds, our religious behavior, our morality. We refuse to look at it. We don't acknowledge it. And that's why when we hear about sins and counterfeit glories and idolatry, we don't take it too seriously. And all the while, what's really happening is that our hearts are just getting hardened. We're growing spiritually apathetic toward God and the things of God. And that's why we don't get excited about the gospel, because there's less reason to be excited about it. If I don't have sin that Jesus needed to die for, why should I love him so much? Why should my life be all about him? That's one way that some of us handle our sin. But the second way that we can handle our sin when we feel so powerless to do anything is to find that the only place we can run to, the only place for safety and refuge and sanctuary, is to fall into the wide open, welcoming arms of Jesus. To collapse onto him because we have no strength to hold ourselves up. And to fall on him because he's the only one who can do something about our spiritual condition. Jesus is the only one who can defeat our sin. He's the only one who can cleanse us. He's the only one who can wash us and purify us. And it's this approach, falling on Jesus, 
coming to him in our repentance. It's that which keeps our heart, not hardened, but tender. As we stay close to Jesus, warmed by Jesus. See, but that's not all repentance is. Repentance is not just running to Jesus. It's not simply turning to Jesus. Repentance requires turning from sin. And for that, I want to look this evening at this very familiar story in Jonah. And when you hear it again tomorrow morning as Pastor Paul preaches on Jonah 3, it'll be extra familiar. So let me summarize what's happening so far in this book. Jonah is called by God to go to the city of Nineveh. It's a city in Assyria. And he's called to go with a message of judgment. And the message is essentially this, call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, historically, you may already know this, but Israel and Assyria were enemies. And so you might think Jonah would want to go on this trip. You'd think Jonah would be excited to be the bearer of bad news so he could rub it in their face. These people who were his enemies, these people whom he hated. I mean, if you told me that I had an opportunity to go and pronounce judgment on those who've wronged me, those I dislike, those who offended me, you wouldn't have to ask me twice. I'd happily go and I'd skip along the way. But Jonah, interestingly, doesn't respond like that. Jonah runs away. Now, why does he run away? Well, the answer is this, because Jonah knew and understood something really important about the heart of God. Jonah knew something about God, a theology beyond what we know. Jonah knew just how merciful and gracious, slow to anger and steadfast in love God was. And so he knew that if he went and gave them this word of warning, this word of judgment, God would relent if his people would repent. Jonah knew that God's worst enemies, his worst enemies, the vilest of people, the scumbags and the sinners, if they would repent, God would relent. And this is why Jonah refuses to go. He knows that the warning of this oncoming judgment is actually a gracious thing to do. And this is why he thought it was better to run away. And so he runs away. You know the story. He runs away. He gets in a boat. He gets caught in a storm. He gets thrown overboard into the raging sea. He's swallowed by a big fish. He's in there for three days. He gets spit up on dry land three days later. And after all, he ends up going to Nineveh. And there his worst fears are realized because he shows up in Nineveh. And we didn't read this, but in verse 4, he declares, Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He declares the word of judgment, and here's the response in verse 5. The people of Nineveh believed God. And that's where our passage picks up today. So if you have a Bible, open with me. Look with me at verse 6. Verse 6, we read this. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now, the king is obviously convicted. He's struck right in his heart, and he calls for a citywide fast and for every person to adorn a sackcloth. We read in verses 7 and 8, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beef be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Now, in the Old Testament, to put on sackcloth and to call for a fast was an outward expression of repentance. It's what you did when you were convicted of sin. And what's interesting is that this wasn't enough for repentance. Simply calling a fast, simply putting on sackcloth, even calling out on God's name wasn't enough for repentance. That's equivalent of us when we maybe weep over our sins, cry, we become overridden with guilt and grief. Have you experienced that? We're overtaken with shame and sorrow. And we cry out to God not because we are truly convicted of sin, but because we don't like the feeling of guilt and of burden so we make a confession that we don't actually believe. So this, this alone isn't enough for repentance. It's like when I was younger, I have a brother who's six years older than I. 
And we'd always wrestle when mom and dad weren't home. And being six years older, at that young of an age, he would easily pin me down, just throw his weight on top of me, heavy on my chest, pin my arms to my side, and I would cry out in desperation, anything and everything to get him off of me. He would say, Andrew, repeat after me. And I would say, Young, you're the best. You're stronger than me. You're smarter than me. Okay, I admit, Oma likes you better than me. And we would call out, call out confessions simply to relieve the pressure. Fasting, sackcloth, calling on God's name, weeping, crying, feeling guilty, feeling grief, feeling sorrow, feeling ashamed. These are all expressions of repentance, but they themselves do not evidence repentance. So then, what is the evidence of repentance? We see that in verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. What is the evidence of repentance? It is that they turned away from their evil way. They didn't simply turn to God, call out to God, but in turning to God, they turned from their wickedness. They turned from their sin. They resolved to fight their sin and flee their sin, to hate their sin. And it's this repentance in Nineveh that led to revival in the city, a repentance that required two turns, a turn to God and a turn away from sin, a turn that required them to see sin as vile and disgusting and to see God as gracious and merciful. And my question to you, dear friends, is this. Are you regularly repenting in a genuine way, in a way that requires two turns, a turn to God and a turn away from sin? You see, I think so much of the problem with the way that we do repentance is that we only make one of these turns. And when we only make one of these turns, we're only experiencing some of the gospel. Some of the gospel at best, none of the gospel at worst. Because if you're not turning from sin, you're minimizing God's holiness. But if you're not turning to God, then you're minimizing his grace. But when you turn from sin and you turn to God, then and only then can you experience the joy and the freedom of the gospel. Then and only then can times of refreshing fall upon you. You know, it's in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3, that the apostle Peter enters Solomon's portico and he begins preaching a sermon. And in Acts chapter 3, this is what he preaches as he proclaims the good news. He says, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repent and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Why? So that a time of refreshing would befall you. Repent of your sins. Turn back to God. And God would open the floodgates for his sweet mercy to fall on you, for there to be a time of refreshing. What happens when things aren't refreshed? They become stagnant. They become stale. What happens when you aren't refreshed? You grow tired and weary. What happens when we don't repent and turn to God? We're not refreshed. Spiritual dryness. Spiritual plateauing. See, friends, when we don't properly repent and we don't make both turns, we cut ourselves off from the time of refreshing that the Lord wants to bring to us. I'm afraid many in our generation have not learned how to truly repent. We know how to say, I'm sorry. We know how to feel ashamed. We know how to be struck with guilt. So many of us know how to turn to God, but what we fail to learn 
is how to turn from sin. And yet in every revival, this is how God's spirit moves among his people. He empowers us to make both turns. It's what happens in 2 Kings 22. I alluded to it last night. King Josiah received the law. He confessed his sins, and then he turned from them. What did he do? In turning from his sins, he tore down the high places. He tore down the places of worship, false worship. Turning to God, he turned from sin. It's what happened in Nineveh here in Jonah chapter 3. The people heard Jonah's message of God's judgment. They believed in him. They cried out. And then what did they do? They turned from their evil ways. Turning to God, they turned from sin. It's what happened in Korea, as we heard Pastor Andrew talk about this morning. In the great Pyongyang revival, as people's hearts were stirred by God, they confessed their sins to those they injured. They returned stolen property they returned stolen money. Turning to God, they turned from sin. It's what happened in the Asbury Revival in 1970. After stirring college students to repentance, the manager of the bookstore testified that he knew revival had come because finally the debts were being paid off and student after student were coming with all the books they had stolen from the bookstore. Turning to God, they turned from sin. In 1995 at Wheaton College, when revival broke out for a whole week, students prayed evening into morning confessing their sins. And by the end of the week, they had collected large, many large black hefty trash bags filled with pornography and drugs and alcohol that the students had thrown into them. Turning to God, they turned from sin. You see, friends, this is what true repentance is. Not just turning to God, turning from sin. Would we learn how to do that? So that the waves of grace would fall upon us in a time of refreshing. And that it might lead to revival in our hearts as we become a repenting people. And lead to revival in our church as we become a repenting body. And in order for that to happen, we need to unmask two false forms of repentance. Two false forms of repentance that we're so tempted to adapt. I've named them performative repentance and pretend repentance. And what do I mean by that? First, performative repentance. Performative repentance is when you turn away from sin, but you don't turn to God. So you're really not repentant at all. And it looks like something like this. You admit your sin. You're distraught over it. You do your best to stop sitting. You turn away from it. And then you come to God in confession. But you're not really trusting in God for his mercy to forgive you. You're really trusting in your confession to save you. In short, you're treating your repentance like that's the good work that should impress God. And so you secretly come to God and you say, well, God, you should forgive me. Look how bad I feel. Look how many te tears I've shed. Look, look, I've beaten myself up over this. Don't, God, don't you see I'm not letting myself off the hook too easily? I take my sin seriously. And so rather than trusting Jesus to atone for our sins, we're trusting in our repentance to atone for our sins. And what does this do? When you trust in your repentance as the good works, keeps you from Jesus. It keeps you from collapsing into his merciful arms. Maybe you've even said something like this once. I can't forgive myself. So you hold on to this feeling, feeling rotten, disgusting. You think you deserve bad things to happen to you. Maybe you even sabotage your life. Why? Because you think your sorrow over sin is more important than God's actual forgiveness over your sin. You see, in performative repentance, you refuse to truly believe that God alone has paid your debt through Jesus. You refuse to thrust yourself upon his mercy because you think your performance in repenting should be enough. It's like this, imagine that you won the lottery. $100 million. $1 billion. That's usually what the Powerball is going for these days. $1 billion. And you've won it. And the next day you're at a convenience store with your kid and they want to buy a 99 cent piece of candy. And when you go to pay for it, they refuse your money. 
And they insist, no, I'll pay for this. And so from their pockets, they pull forth two pennies. Then they dig a little deeper and they produce another nickel. Seven cents is all they can produce. Seven cents, which is far from enough. But as much as you want to buy it for them, as much as you desire to buy it for them, as much as you insist they refuse your offer, why? When they don't believe you're rich or generous. They may know you won the lottery. They may know you're rich. But what good is their knowledge if they don't rely on you, if they don't ask you? You see, left to themselves, they would never be able to afford this piece of candy. Only you can pay for it. But not trusting you, there is no payment. You see, in the same way, when our repentance relies ultimately on us, when we turn from sin, but we don't turn to God, we're still left in the debt of our sin. Yeah, you can feel really, really, really bad about what you've done. But even that is not enough to satisfy God's holy wrath and justice against sin. And so performative repentance, turning from sin but not turning to God, it's not true, genuine repentance. Left to it, we're still stuck in sin. That's the first false form of repentance we need to unmask. Here's the second. Pretend repentance. Pretend repentance is when you turn to God, but you haven't actually turned from sin. So you run to God while you're still holding on to your sin, so it's no repentance at all. You're just pretending because those who truly love God love the things that God loves. Those who love God hate the things God detests. So until you turn from sin, until you flee sin, slay sin, shed blood and sweat and tears in your fight against sin, you're just acting like a hypocrite. You don't really understand that the God you're turning to, who he really is, because if you did, you'd realize sin isn't some impersonal offense against them, some transgression against a universal cosmic code of ethic. Sin is a personal transgression because behind the law that you're breaking stands a lawgiver. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that maybe some of you have been pulled over by a police officer before. Rolling through a stop sign. Speeding. Expired tags. Hopefully nothing more serious than that. Now, when the officer is merciful, he'll write you a warning. But when the officer is completely just, he'll write you a ticket and give you a fine. After all, you have broken the law. But here's the thing, whether it's a warning or a citation, whether merciful or lawfully just, have you ever seen an officer weeping over the fact that they had to pull you over? Have you ever seen an officer lamenting in heartbreak that you violated the law? Probably not. Why? Because although sworn to uphold and enforce the law, the law is not theirs. The law is impersonal to them. So your violation, your offense is not a personal offense. And sometimes we view sin like this. We view sin as a violation of an impersonal law without realizing that the law was given to us by the lawgiver. The law is not abstract. The law is personal because it comes to us from God's heart. You see, friends, once you see sin in this way, you realize you can't just turn to God without turning from sin. Because sin in your life does far more than just lead to wrath and condemnation. Sin in your life strains your relationship with God. Sin in your life ruins fellowship with him. Sin in your life takes the sweetness knowing God and makes it bitter. If you come to God confessing your sins while still committing those sins, you're only pretending to repent. 
And you can never embrace God's forgiveness because your hands are full embracing your own sin. It's no wonder then that our spiritual lives suffer because we cannot simultaneously delight in our Savior as we delight in our sin. You cannot have revival if you do not revile sin. You cannot have revival if you revel in sin. So what does God call us to do? He calls us to make both turns. To turn away from sin and turn and take hold of him and his mercy. Dear friends, it's true biblical repentance. The two turns. Is that marking your life? See, this kind of repentance can't be manufactured, it can't be manipulated, it can't be fabricated, it can't be produced. It's spirit-ignited, spirit-initiated, spirit-instigated. It doesn't happen because we dim the lights. It doesn't happen because we hear the fervor of the crowd. It doesn't happen because the music is moving and it sets the mood just right. It only happens when we understand the heart of God like Jonah did. This kind of repentance and revival isn't the product of technique or strategy or human wiles. In this way, we have a lot to learn about church history. The past few sermons, I've alluded to the first great awakening and that great American pastor, Jonathan Edwards. Well, that took place in the 18th century. Do you know that there was a second great awakening that took place in the 19th century? And so just like Jonathan Edwards is the most notable figure attached to the first great awakening, the most notable figure in the second great awakening might be Charles Finney. And Charles Finney had this way, this strategy, to implement new measures, he called it, new measures to yield the fruit of revival. He believed man could engineer the best conditions for revival to take place. And so, like a farmer employs new techniques to reap the biggest harvest, he believed that could be done among the people. And so one of his brilliant ideas, one of the new measures, was to create something called the anxious anxious bent or the anxious seat. And essentially what that was, it was an area up in the front of the pulpit where pastors Andrew and Paul are sitting. And it was this visible part of the sanctuary, and Finney would invite people to come and sit there. Before the sermon, he would call those who were uh, troubled in mind, those who were bogged down by a guilty conscience, those who were already feeling a bit spiritually anxious, those who were emotionally primed to respond, he would call them to sit right there. And then in the midst of the sermon, as they were listening and as he was preaching, and he began to notice the way that they were beginning to get emotional, then he would begin not to stir their affections, but to tug and manipulate their emotions. It'd be really hard to get through and read Pastor Paul because I don't know if he knows what emotion is, but... (laughs) When it came time then for people to make decisions for Christ, to repent and to believe, to respond to the altar call, he would look upon those in the anxious bench as well as everyone in the congregation, and they would feel the pressure to have to repent and stand and confess their sins and give their lives to Jesus. I mean, it was this technique, this strategy to manipulate and manufacture repentance and revival, and it serves as a warning for us that revival and repentance cannot be manufactured or produced It can only be brought about as a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Conviction of sin that leads to confession of sin, which leads to crucifying sin, can only come from God and God alone. How does God stir repentance in our hearts? It's not through new measures and new techniques. Romans 2, verse 9 makes it clear. God's kindness leads you to repentance. What's going to lead to true, genuine repentance that will create revival in your life and in this church? It's to see and to know the heart of God. To see and to know his character. Why did God end up forgiving Nineveh? You know the story. Why? Answer the question. Why did God end up forgiving Nineveh? Nineveh. 
It's not because their repentance changed his heart. It wasn't like God was an angry person and he just needed to be diffused. He just needed to be given a puppy so he would calm down and not be so angry and wrathful anymore. Repentance did not change God's heart. Repentance changed God's response because they repented, he relented. But it didn't change his heart. Now, what do I mean by that? God's heart was always the same. The same then as it is now. You see, friends, God doesn't forgive people because of what he becomes. He forgives people because of who he is. Listen to what Jonah said about God in chapter 4, verse 2. You are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. You see, friends, your repentance doesn't make God do or become something he's not. Jonah doesn't say the people repented and God became gracious and he became merciful. The people confessed and therefore God became slow to anger and he began to abound in steadfast love. God was always and already these things. It's because God is gracious and merciful. It's because he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love that we have the freedom and the safety to come and repent and confess. You see, when you forget this about the heart of God, repentance will remain distant and foreign. And when repentance remains distant and foreign, God remains distant and foreign. Times of refreshing are cut off spiritual oxygen restricted from our lives. Nineveh repented. God relented. But here's the thing about Nineveh's repentance. As far as they were concerned, they were throwing a Hail Mary. You see, because if you look in verse 9, here's what they asked. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Who knows? Well, friends, we know. We know, we who have confidence and the assurance that the Ninevites never had. We know because we have the promise of the gospel and the person of Jesus You see, God's wrath for Nineveh's sins and wickedness that he relented from, he did not relent of it forever. His wrath against your sins and your wickedness that he relents of is not suspended in the air. His wrath for our waywardness and our wickedness was unleashed upon Christ our substitute. In order for God to be gracious and merciful, he did not compromise his holiness and his justice because mercy and justice met at the cross where Jesus was slain for your sins, where Jesus stood in the place of your guilt, where Jesus took the death that your unrighteousness deserves so that you might find in him safety to turn to him in repentance and power to turn away from sin. God showed you kindness on the cross because it's his kindness that leads you to repentance. So here's the gospel's confidence held out for you in 1 John 1. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dear friends, if we repent, God relents. And as Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Let me close with this story. It's a story I originally read by Brendan Manning. I've adapted it for us tonight. Let me read you the story. There was once a godly woman, a God-fearing woman, who was alarmed because she was having visions of Jesus every night. 
And these visions reoccurred so frequently and so vividly, and she was so unsure of what they could mean that she sought the counsel of her pastor. And he listened to her carefully and patiently as she told him the vision she was having of Jesus and trying with all of his might and wisdom to discern the legitimacy of these visions. Here was his counsel. Dear sister, the next time you have a vision of Jesus, I want you to ask him a question. Ask him to tell you what sins I confessed the last time I repented. Now that very night, the woman had another vision and she called the pastor right away, eager to hear what answer she might have received in her dream. He asked, what did Jesus say? And the woman looked at him and said, these are his words, not mine, dear pastor. But when I asked them what sins you last confessed when you repented, his reply was, I don't remember. See, friends, such is the forgiveness of Christ, that he has removed our sins and he no longer remembers them against you. But you then learn to experience the times of refreshing in personal revival, in corporate revival, as we turn away from the ugliness of sin and we turn to behold the beauty of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.